feel the presence of the Lord in this place today. I feel his presence. I feel his help. I feel his hope. Maybe you came here today and with everything that's happening in your world, you feel hopeless. You came to the right place today. It absolutely has nothing to do with the name on the front of this church. It has everything to do with the presence of God. Because this is nothing but a building with a name. But when God inhabits the praises of his people, something happens. And I believe today God wants you to know that he heard your cry. More specifically, he's going to snatch you out of the depression that you've been battling. He's going to rip labels off of you that other people have placed upon you for 20 plus years. They've said this is who you are. This is who you will always be. But they cannot control the declaration that God has placed over you. How many of you know you just don't want to miss a, you don't want to miss a Sunday at Epicenter Church? How many of you know what I'm talking about? You, you know why? It's because you 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 just never know what you're gonna miss. And it's not because I'm here or because this praise band is gonna rock it out, it's because God is here, Richie. And when God is here, that means his hope is here. If God is here, that means his help is here. If God is here, that means his salvation is here. If God is here, that means his healing is here. If God is here, that means his forgiveness is here. If God is here, that means his breakthrough is here. Somebody say, he's here. Somebody else say, I'm ready. So here's the deal. When you get one of those texts on Saturday nights that Epicenter sends you and it's like driving you crazy because we're always texting y'all. Right then on Saturday night, you need to stop what you're doing, change your plans, get your clothes out for the next day so that you can be on time. But we understand if you cannot be here, that's why we put the message in so many different places so that you can watch it back. Can I say this? I, this past week, I, I could not stop thinking about last week's message. Last week's message, if you were here, was check your attitude. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, check your attitude. Husbands, look at your wives and say, how you doing? <laughs> you looking good today. <laughs> Personal experience, I'm just telling you. I thought, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought we would be done with this series distorted last week. But God's not finished. So we're going to stay in it for at least one more week. Uh, and this is week five of this series. Somebody say distorted. We are, however, going to transition from this narrative or the narrative that we've been in over the last four weeks, which was Exodus and the book of Exodus and Moses and the Israelites. And we're going to fast forward several hundred years and we're going to go to a psalm, Psalm 62, verses 1 through 12. Y'all excited? Psalm 62, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to just say this to you. I preached so hard in the first service, I broke my glasses. My lenses flew off. No, I got a pair now. They're just too strong. I got a pair. So we're transitioning. We're in this series, Distorted. The definition of distorted, and then I'm going to let you sit down after this, but just hang on. The definition of distorted is to be pulled or twisted out of shape. A misleading impression. Let me just say under the current cultural climate, we have been pulled and we have been twisted. And many of us are out of shape. There are misleading impressions. We're overwhelmed by news. We don't know what to believe. We don't know who to believe. We're told what we should believe. 
we're inundated with editorials and news feeds and bombarded with opinions and social media buzz. In fact, this past week, Instagram and Facebook went down and you would have thought the world was coming to an end. <laughs> People didn't know what to think. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to think for themselves. What ends up happening with a distorted perspective is you begin to have a wrong attitude. The reason why you have a wrong attitude is because you're not functioning according to your faith, but rather you're functioning according to your feelings. And when you function according to your feelings, it's so e easy for you to be angry. Anger is where we were at last week. We were talking about anger. Can we finish up our conversation on anger this week? Is that all right? I'm going to let you just be seated. Some of y'all are looking at me sideways like I want to sit down. I want to finish up this conversation on anger today because here's a thought. Let me just say it this, this way. Anger can and will erode away your confidence. Anger will erode away your confidence. David writes about this very concept. David in Psalm 62 has found himself in this place in life where he's way up, he's praising God, but then he gets into this place where he remembers everything that's happening around him. And everything that is happening around him is overwhelming him. He really doesn't know what to do with it. He doesn't know how to compartmentalize it. He doesn't know how to walk through it. He doesn't know how to, you'll see. In fact, you can see the intonation of David's writing you can hear the tone in the song, if you will. Because really, this is a song about a story that unfolded in his life. Can I read some verses with you? Here's what happens in Psalms chapter 62, beginning in verse 1. David writes, Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress, and I will never, ever be shaken. Here's David. He's singing this song. Hold on. Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock. He's my fortress, and I will never be shaken. David is showing us where his confidence comes from. His confidence comes from God. He's showing us that. He's showing us that. Listen, let me tell you this. You know how you check your attitude? We were talking about checking your attitude last week. You know how you check your attitude? By knowing where your confidence comes from. So we see that he's got this great confidence in God. But then in verses three and four, something happens. The tone changes. There's a shift. We see the ebbs and the flows of his writing. We see the ups and the downs in his faith, Daniel. Look what he writes. He says in verse 2, remember the very last few words of verse 2, or I will never be shaken. Verse 3, in the middle of writing this song, how long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from this lofty place. They take delight in lies with their mouths they bless, but their hearts they curse. Hold on, he's, he's praising the God. God, he's praising the Lord. And, and, and all of a sudden, he's like, I will not be shaken. How long will this last? They're trying to topple me. They're trying to assault me. They... Bless me with their mouths. Curse me with their hearts. You can see that he's overwhelmed. There's a shift in the emotional pattern of this song. There's trauma that shows up, even anger. How long will this last? We see this showing up. And then verses 5 and 6, as we see that the tone begins to change and Verses 3 and 4, we see in verses 5 and 6, he's like, how, or, remember this, how long will this last? I, I think we could see ourselves before I read verse 5. 
in, in the fact that we've, we've asked ourselves, how long will this current cultural crisis last? How, how long will this political mess last? How long will COVID last? How long will this uncertainty in the economy last? How long will it last? And so then in verse 5, he, he, he gets a hold of himself again. And he says, yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock. He is my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He's my right, mighty rock and my, my refuge. Then he turns his attention to us. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If Weighed on the balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord. It's unfailing love. And the second thing is you reward everyone according to what they have done. It's verses 3 and 4, though, that I want to hang out in. For a second. It's verses three and four where the tone changes. He's praising God, just lifting up the name of the Lord. Then all of a sudden in verses three and four, how long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down the leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight with their mouths. They bless, but with their hearts, they, they curse. You see the tone change in the song. There's a tone that changes. This, his tone changes. How many of you know that things can be going great in life and then all of a sudden someone or something can come in and change the tone? You with me? Like this past week, I'm at the house. I'm working on some things that I need to work on and I, I break a ceramic pumpkin Duda, something that's Kim's. I'm trying to get the evidence out of the way. And Kim has this Holy Spirit moment where the tone changes. There's a grit of the teeth. I got this. I got this. Listen, the truth is, let me just finish telling you the story. I'm out in the yard and I'm working. I, I break this thing and um, she's holding my drink. I'm just showing you how the tone can change. And so she had made me this drink because she knew I was like hot and sweaty. And she's bringing me something to drink. Well, when she saw that was broke, she just looked at me and went, poured it out. <laughs> the tone can change just like that. Y'all pray for it. The Holy Spirit needs to... I'm just telling you, I'll pray for it. Or it's like I heard this story about this, this, this old story about a, a woman who was older in her years and she was trying to get her answering machine and the right message on her answering machine. You know, none of y'all have any, anybody in here have an answering machine? I hope not because those things, put your hands down, y'all. They make voicemail now. You don't need that. I'm just saying. But, but anyway, she, she couldn't get the message right. You know, she was trying to get the message. She couldn't get it. Every time she played it back, she heard it. She didn't like it. So finally, she gets so frustrated, and she just says, leave your tone at the end of the message. <laughs> Somebody look at your neighbor and say, check your tone. <laughs> look at another neighbor and tell them the title of today's message. Check your tone. <laughs> That's where David's at. David is trying to check his tone. He's, he's gotten into this place where he's loving on God in verses 1 and 2. Then 3 and 4, he realizes, man, his life is just, it's a lot. And he begins to evaluate his trust in God right, right there in verses 3 and 4. He begins to evaluate his trust in God. And he says, how long will this last? They're trying to topple me. They're assaulting me with lies. How long will this last? I, I feel like I'm about to topple over. I mean, think about this. Remember, this is a worship song that he's writing. You know, so it's like David in verses 1 and 2 is, My hope is built on nothing less 
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Just as he's getting into worship really good, he's, he's thinking about the Lord, he's thinking about the goodness of God. And, and then all of a sudden in verses 3 and 4, it becomes the course of his life. My, my hope is gone, I've seen the news. And all it does is give me the blues. If you don't be quiet, you're making me mad. And then I might have to slap your dad. <laughs> Some of y'all like, y'all just polish your halos. Y'all like, I ain't never wanted to slap my husband. I ain't never wanted to. Come on now, y'all be, just be for real. Sometimes the tone. So here's David. David is writing this. Listen, I'm just being honest with you. He's in verses 3 and 4. And 3 and 4, how many of you know verses 3 and 4 almost become the course in your life? It's like, you know, when we're singing a worship song, the course is what we do more and more and more. Some of y'all are like, man, we've gone over that course like 15 times. We all got it by now. But the course is like, it's, it's like the, the point that you're trying to drive home. And sometimes verses 3 and 4 is like where we're stuck. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And so he's trying to show us how difficult it is to hang out with people who are putting pressure on you and people who are talking about you and people who are doing you wrong and situations that are beyond your control and all of this stuff and COVID and this and that. And, and, and he says, I, I feel like I'm going to topple over. And if you think about our country for the last 18 months, it seems like we could topple over. If you think about even as individuals, your last 18 months, it, it's almost like you could topple over. It's COVID, it's restrictions, it's mandates, it's masks, it's, it's vaccines, it's death, it's quarantines, it's emotional trauma, it's division at, a, at an all-time high. There's problems and situations and struggles, and so we've shifted how we do life. We all have. We've shifted how we do life, how we do work, how we do our relationships, how, how we do just whatever. We, we, we've shifted it all around. And as a result of that shift, psychologists say that confidence is at an all-time low. Let me illustrate that for you personally speaking. As a church, the metrics that we used to use prior to COVID to evaluate success are not the metrics that we can use today. Things have shifted. Large churches like ours, roughly 50% of the people nationwide have gone back to church, which is the same for us. And then you're like, well, how do you do church the way you feel like God wanted you to do church and meet needs and demands and culture and help people and do this and do that when 50% of your people haven't made it back, which makes it harder to get volunteers. It makes it harder financially. It makes it hard. All of these different things become so much more difficult. And then at the same time, you're overwhelmed with everything else that's piled on you for life and in life. And, and you don't know. Sometimes you just feel like you're just so insecure and you feel like you, you don't have the strength to do it. And you feel like you're in this dark place, this dark season and you don't know how to get out of it and you don't know what to do. You don't feel like you're strong enough to do it. It's like every Sunday, I think, God, how can I give the people, your people, a message of encouragement when the times are so discouraging? I mean, think about that concept for a minute. You try to encourage someone and they're right in the middle of just the most difficult season and it seems like your words are just going in one ear and out the other. And I'm like, God, I want to I encourage your people in the most discouraging time. How do I build up their confidence when there's so many things that is robbing their confidence? How? Some of you are in similar places. Some of you are found yourself in places where you're, you're, it's beyond your control. And, and we allow fear. Here's the deal. We allow fear to, to culminate into anger and the circumstances, you, you begin to question God, like, where is God at? It's like David, he's right in the middle of praising God, and then he remembers, hold on a second, all this stuff that's happening in his life. And he's like, God, you put all these things in my heart, and I thought those things were going to come to fruition. But now he's like, but they, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to topple over. How much longer is this going to last? And now he's beginning to wonder if those things will ever happen, and his hope is gone, and he's... He feels like he has no confidence, but can I remind you of something? 
Philippians chapter 1, Paul writes this. He says, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. That verse is not fixated on cosmetic confidence. That verse is fixated on substance. That he who began a good work in you. It doesn't say that being confident in this with the shoes that you wear, that you're going to be able to have swag. It doesn't say being confident in this because of, of your abilities that you're going to be able to handle anything that comes your way. It doesn't say, it says being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Not the job that will be faithful to complete it. Not your swag will be faithful to complete it. Not your ability will, will be faithful to complete it. But he will be faithful to, to complete it. Are you with me? You can't even say, hey, I'm good at my job. Watch, just look how good I am at my job. I'm just good at my job. Because the truth is, over the last 18 months, anything that could be shaken has been shaken. And when all of that stuff is stripped away, <laughs> what you were good at is stripped away, that is who you are. So David, he's, that's where he's at. He's like, verses 3 and 4, 3 and 4, 3 and 4, 3 and 4. I mean, he's like... God, I don't, I don't know what to do. He's so stressed out. And then he even starts talking about the people that are around him. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, they, put verse 4 up for me. They, verse 4, they, surely they, they intend to topple me from my law. They. Can I tell you something? He's in a dark season. When you are in a dark season, in order to get through the dark season, you cannot have the wrong people around you. You cannot have the wrong people around you or you will not make it through the dark season. That verse goes on to say, they take delight in lies. Surely they intend to topple me from a lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Saying one thing but they're doing another. The more I thought about that, I thought, hold on a second, that in some ways describes us. Because the same voice, mouth, tongue that we use to praise God with on Sunday, we use it throughout the rest of the week to slander people. Same tongue that we're using to lift up God with, we use it to tear others down with. The same tongue that we are using to lift up the creator with, we use to tear down the created. And we wonder why we're stuck in verses 3 and 4. You know, one of the ways to know that to have the wrong tone, one, well, let me just say this. There is a time for many of us that we have the wrong tone, and that's because someone responded to us in the wrong tone. But can I tell you something? You can't control how someone responds to you, but you can control how you respond to that. And so, let me just say this. I, I don't know who needs to hear this. But you got to make sure you got the right people around you. You have to make sure in life you have the right people around. You need people around you that when you are in a dark season, they will encourage you. But you also need some people around you that you will encourage. You cannot always be the person who's in need. Sometimes you have to be the person who's meeting the need. Because if you are always in need, you will wonder why you do not have friends. That'd be running the other way when they see you coming. <laughs> Listen, I'm just saying right now, I'm just going to be honest with you. Right now, if you're walking up to some people and you're trying to have conversation and they're like, oh, you're all over the place. Hey, yeah, I got to go um, water my water. I mean, um, I got to go... 
I got to go, go, go brush my cat. You know, if they've got this excuse, the problem might not be them. Y'all don't want to hear this today, do you? So David's at an all-time low. I mean, he's, he feels like his confidence is leaving, and I, I, I've done a lot of work to get to this place. This is what I, I need you to hear today. Where your trust is placed determines the amount of confidence you have. Where your trust is placed determines the amount of confidence that you have. Let me take it one step further. Where your trust is placed determines when your confidence leaves. Mm. So how do you remain calm in the calamity? Here's the first thing you've got to do. Write this down. You've got to build your inner confidence. You've got to build your inner confidence. How, how do you do that? Listen, it's by what you are magnifying in your life. If you are magnifying your problem, your circumstance, the events of this world in, in such a way that they become greater in your conversation than your Lord, then you are magnifying the wrong thing. You see, you've got to be careful with what you're magnifying. If you're magnifying, if you're, somebody wrote Jesus loves me on the bottle here. It, it, that's so sweet. Um, if you're magnifying the wrong thing, let's just say this is the wrong thing. I don't know what this represents. James, I don't know what this represents. I don't know what this represents. Side note, but James made this beautiful table that I'm just going to show off for everybody in this place, man. He gave it to the church this past week. Just kudos to James. I'm going, I'll, I'll put a picture up so y'all can see it. This is a beautiful table. Um, but, but, but let me just say this. It, it, whatever this is, Okay, this is frustration, this is, this is um, economic uncertainty, this is COVID, this is um, um, political chaos, this is wokeness, this is whatever it is. I don't care, whatever it is. Your personal problems, your situations, the more that you focus on those, the more that you begin to talk about those, the more that they get in your field of vision, the more that you are magnifying those things, and pretty soon you are trying to see through those things, and the image that you are seeing is very distorted. That's why the Bible says to magnify the Lord. Can I tell you something? When you magnify the Lord, it's not that you are making God bigger. You can't make God any bigger. It's that you are allowing God to be bigger in you. It's some of you have got to stop allowing your anger to be bigger in you than your God. You've got to stop allowing your political views to be bigger in you than your God. You've got to stop allowing your, your frustrations to in, that, that you have with whatever's happening in life. To, to They can't be bigger than your God. You've got to start changing the conversation from the political mess to how good God is. You've got to start changing the conversation from the pandemic response to God's response. You've got to start changing the conversation from, from whatever is happening in your life to how good God is. You've got to change your conversation from the influence that the news has over you to the influence of the good news in your life. You've got to begin to change the conversation. Why? Because God is your salvation. He is your hope. He is your refuge. He is your source. Can I tell you something? If you have placed your trust in anything other than God, it will let you down. If you have placed your trust in your abilities, they will sooner than later let you down. If you have placed your trust in a political party, it will sooner than later let you down. If you've placed your trust in your physical image, can I tell you something? Sooner than later, things will begin to drop, things will begin to leave, things will begin to fall out. It will let you down. If you place your trust in your job, then you are giving your employer the ability to rob you and strip you of your faith. Your trust has to be in God. That's what David is beginning to realize. He's singing it, then three and four. But let me show you something because I think this is like, I can hear David singing about this, this story that I'm about to show you. First Samuel chapter 17. Put it up for me. I'm going to just read it from back there. Write this down. Look it up when you get home. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. 
Samuel has been anointed to be the king. I mean, uh, David has been anointed to be the king. And, and his father says, here, take this sandwich to your, to your brother who's on the front lines. He's fighting battles against the Philistines. Make sure that he gets this because he's hungry. And so here's what happens. When Eliab, which is David's oldest brother, heard him speaking. He didn't see him. He heard him. He heard that voice. He was like, oh, hold on a second. It said he burned with anger. Somebody say, check the tone. He burned with anger at him, and he asked, why have you come down here? In other words, like, who do you think you are? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? He's even saying, you can't even, all you're doing is just keeping a few sheep. You're not even many sheep, just a few sheep. I know how conceited your heart is and how wicked your heart is, and you came all the way down here so that you could watch the battle. Who do you think you are? I can hear in that moment David saying, God, how long will they assault me? I feel like I'm going to topple. I feel like I'm out of control in this situation. Why, why are there lies? Here is David. All he's trying to do, Dwayne, is feed his brother. He's trying to feed the very person that's trying to fight him. Do you ever feel like that? Like the person that you're feeding is fighting you? No one look at the person sitting next to you. <laughs> but 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 let, let me. I, I wrote this. I wrote this down. Your potential is not decided by someone else. It's declared over you by the Lord. Look at verses 34 through 37. Put those up for me. This is the rest of that story. I'm just going to synopsize this. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and I struck it and I rescued the sheep from his mouth. And then he turned on me and I seized him by his hair, struck it and killed it. And your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. The uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. And the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go, <laughs> go and the Lord will be with you. Here's Goliath. No one can beat Goliath. And here's David, this teenage boy. And he's come up with, you know, five stones and a slingshot. But can you hear David's confidence? David's confidence, he said, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. In fact, when he's standing before Goliath, Goliath said, is this all you can send me out here, you great nation of Israel, this little boy to do a, a man's job? And, and, and David looks at Goliath and he said, you come against me with the sword and the spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. The confidence, the inner confidence that he has. The second thing that you've got to do if you want to be calm in the calamity is you've got to have more inner confidence by speaking to yourself. How many of you know sometimes you got to talk to yourself? Anybody in here talk to yourself? You talk to yourself. Just raise, if you talk to yourself, raise your hand all over this building. You talk to yourself, okay? If you don't talk to yourself, raise your hand. Something wrong with y'all. <laughs> Anybody in here ever answer yourself? Like you're, you're talking and you're answering? Come on, you're a little more shy with that one. Like, mm, yeah. But well, y'all are crazy, I'm just saying. <laughs> let me show you something, though. Let me show you, let me show you, let me show you. you, you you've got to have more inner confidence by, by speaking to yourself. So watch this. So he has verses 1 and 2, he's praising God. Verses 3 and 4 becomes the course of his life, and he's singing it over and over and over. And then all of a sudden he realizes it. And he has to speak to himself. He says, yes, oh, oh yeah, yes, yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I, my soul finds rest in God. Oh, hold on a second. My hope comes from him. <laughs> Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He, he is my fortress, and I will not be shaken. He remembers uh, my salvation and my honor depend on God. He's my mighty rock. He's my refuge. Trust in him at all times, he says. He's my mighty rock. He's my refuge. He's, when he gets to this place of adversity, he begins to realize, hold on a second, I got to begin to, to talk to myself. I, I got to begin to remind myself of how good God's been in my life. I've, I've got to begin to remind myself, even though I'm going through all of this stuff, listen, you don't have to carry the weight that culture tells you that you have to carry. 
You don't have to be who culture has said that you are. You don't even have to listen to the broken system of thoughts this world has. You don't have to be controlled and pay the price for generational curses that have been in your past because something that's in your bloodline, because let me tell you something, God can speak over your life and the declaration that he makes over your life is so much greater than what somebody else has tried to place on your life. So let me tell you something. It's time for some of you to check the tone. Check the tone in your life. Check the tone in your spirit. Somebody get up on your feet and say, check the tone. Look at your neighbor and say, check the tone. Your confidence does not come from what someone else has said about you. So don't let the limitation that others have placed upon you become your insecurity. Verses 8 and following, put it up. It says, trust in him at all times. He turns his attention on everyone else, on you. You people pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are just a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighed on the balance, they're nothing. The difficulties that you're going through, they're really nothing. I'm not trying to minimize your pain. I'm just trying to maximize who God is in your life. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, that's not where your hope comes from. One thing that God has spoken, two things that I have heard. Power belongs to God. He has an unfailing love for you. Here's the last thing that I want you to hear today. The tone of my life reflects the measure of my trust. Did you hear that? The tone in your life reflects the measure of your trust. I just can't help but to think and to feel in my spirit that there are some in this place that the tone in your life it's, it's so loud it's so chaotic it's so overwhelming God wants to remind you today not only of who he is but who you are in him. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you would say today, Pastor Mark, I'm in a place, one area of my life, maybe many areas in your life, that the tone is wrong and you need to check it. And you need God's help right there. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. No one's looking around. I see those hands. I see those hands everywhere. You can put your hands down if you would say, I, Pastor Mark, I, I want to live a life where it's the right tone. I'm just walking to, to the tone of faith and not fear. And I, 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 I want to live that way in every area. If that's you, just, just raise your hand so that I can see it. Last but not least, if you would say today you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you want a, a brand new start, you want forgiveness from your sins, I'm the only one looking around. Just, just lift your hand so that I can, I can see that hand. I see those hands. I, I see those hands. Father, today we come before you, Lord, knowing... Lord, that I've preached the word, the word that you've given to me. I've done the best that I can to communicate that word. Now, God, I need you to make this word come to life in your people. God, as they live it this week, those who need you, Lord, in a certain area, may you strengthen them in that area. May you help them in that area. May you be 
present in that area, Lord, for those who want to walk in, in faith and, and check the tone in their lives, Lord, if, if, if you would remind them that their trust has to be in you, God, may you just do things in their life that only you can. And for those who are giving their hearts to you today, Lord, may you forgive them. May you give them salvation in you, Lord. May you begin to bless them. Lord, may you cause them, Lord, to realize that their best days are yet, a, yet to come. Lord, may you begin to do things in their life that only you can. And so, Father, we thank you. We honor you. We love you. Somebody in this place begin to give God a radical praise. Yeah, come on, yeah.